Leptospirosis is really an important zoonosis in the Caribbean. I'm sure you're all very much aware of this, uh, often associated with flood conditions. Uh, it's uh, the most common zoonosis worldwide and is considered by WHO to be globally re-emerging. Uh, and it's caused by leptospires. There's kind of a, a picture at the bottom. Common, obviously, in tropical and subtropical areas, such as the Caribbean, uh, often associated with rainfall because it's flooding. Uh, the main reservoir host is rodents, but we have other uh, reservoirs in the Caribbean. There hasn't been much research, but uh, there are some wildlife uh, reservoirs as well, such as the mongoose and the opossum, which many of you would call manicou. Um, this was interesting to me that uh, there has been some research done on wildlife reservoirs. Obviously, it, uh, it can infect almost any mammal, um, so domestic livestock as well uh, can be a source of infection for humans. So the transmission of the bacteria very often through the rodent and then through urine to the human uh, through water or soil, very often water. Humans uh, can contract the disease by direct or indirect contact with infected urine, as I just said, from rodents or, or other animals, uh, or by consuming contaminated food or water. People who live in rural areas are at greater risk, and uh, there are a number of occupational um, risks as well. Almost anything where you work in water that can potentially be contaminated by animals, so people that work in rice fields, uh, people that work cleaning sewers and drains, or veterinarians and livestock owners that have direct contact with the animals. There was one study done by Professor Adeshian, I think, in Trinidad that showed a higher um, prevalence among veterinary students than medical students and other students at the University of the West Indies. And again, it's the direct contact with the livestock. Also, there are a number of um, recreational type activities that involve stagnant water usually or fresh water, um, water sports uh, that can be contributing factors to transmission. And I, uh, many of you would know Dr. Hospitalis, who's the executive director of CARFA, and he, he told me how his brother got leptospirosis from fishing here in Trinidad and uh, was admitted to hospital. And Dr. Hospitalis is obviously a medical doctor, and he thought it was dengue. And it was, you know, considered to be dengue until he got jaundice, which is usually pretty bad, you know, it's pretty late in the disease. The brother lived, though. I <laughs> so, um, again, the climatic conditions, rainfall and floods uh, escalate the, the um, spread of the bacteria, and uh, people are more likely to contract it under poor sanitary conditions and particularly poor drainage conditions. Um, animal leptospirosis, as I said, it can infect almost any mammal, even bats and many uh, species of domestic livestock. This, these are uh, the results of a uh, literature review that the Caribet Leptospirosis Working Group did. And so in the Caribbean, there have been studies that found it in cattle, pigs, sheep, goats, horses, and water buffalo. Uh, canine leptospirosis, uh, Dr. Professor Edition has done a lot of this research here at the UE School of Vet Medicine and found canine leptospirosis in healthy dogs and acutely ill dogs. Um, and this is just uh, kind of um, from the literature review, some of the uh, varieties, serovars that were found in the Caribbean were Icterohemorrhagiae, Copenhageni, Canicola, and Autumnalis. There are many serovars and you would, you would uh, be aware of that. The clinical signs in livestock depend on the serovar and the host species. Uh, in the maintenance host, the clinical signs are usually mild and there can be a prolonged carrier state where the animal is infectious for other animals and people but is uh, not sick. In the incidental host, the disease is more severe with higher titers and uh, a short, shorter carrier state where they're infectious. Uh, there is also a chronic uh, form of the disease with abortion, stillbirth, and birth of weak, weak offspring. And this can be, again, sheep, goats, cattle, pigs. The, the signs are pretty generic in, in mammals. Uh, there is a syndrome that's rare in calves where they can be acutely ill 
with a high fever, hemolytic anemia, hemoglobinuria, often referred to as red water, uh, jaundice and pulmonary congestion. But again, what's more common is subclinical infection where they're not actually sick and you don't know that they're infected. In lactating cows, there's an acute milk drop syndrome where there's decreased production of a thick yellow milk with a high somatic cell count and a, a softer udder. But again, these are kind of rare. So in livestock, again, it's associated with rats. Leaving the food out attracts the rats. Um, it's also associated with animals drinking from ponds. And um, that is an aborted calf caused by leptospirosis. And your rule out would be? Thank you. Uh, in dogs, it can be subclinical as well. They can be asymptomatic or they can be quite ill. As I said, Prof. Adeshian's study found it in sick dogs and not, not sick dogs. So if they're sick, the clinical signs can include anorexia, fever, joint pain, muscle pain, vomiting and diarrhea, and conjunctivitis. They don't always have all these signs, but these are the potential signs. In, in a severe case, uh, the dogs can be jaundiced as, I don't know if you can see the picture on the right is a severely jaundiced uh, dog and clotting problems cause blood in the stool or urine as we just described in calves. Uh, the diagnostic tests in animals, uh, microscopic agglutination test is the only test that can distinguish between the serovars. Uh, there's also ELISA tests. Then there are uh, antigen detection tests such as dark field microscopy and immunofluorescence, but these are not very good because they have very low sensitivity and specificity. Culture is also possible of blood, urine, and tissue. Um, often, I guess, on post-mortem diagnosis, but they're difficult in time consuming. There's a number of special stains for leptospirosis that also have a low sensitivity, and PCR um, is now becoming much more used. But I learned recently it cannot distinguish between serovars. It can confirm lepto, but not distinguish between serovars. Microscopic agglutination test would have to be used. So again, the serovars found in people are similar, obviously, to the serovars I just described in animals here in this region. Um, clearly, it's much more often seen in the rainy season in people than in the dry season because of the association with water and flooding. Uh, in humans, lepto is considered to be an overlooked and neglected tropical disease because it's difficult to diagnose. I mean, the fever, headache, arthralgia, all that stuff. Uh, acute undifferentiated fever in the Caribbean is diagnosed as, in people, Dengue, thank you. Um, and, you know, the treatment's very nonspecific for, for dengue. The, the sad thing is that, you know, people die of lepto in this region and they don't need to die. It's quite treatable with antibiotics, diet, doxycycline and so on. And it's, it's always sad to hear about somebody dying of lepto because of misdiagnosis. Um, so again, the tests are similar to what I just described in animals for people. It's underreported because it's often just missed. It's, it's treated as chikungunya now probably and dengue. Um, the asymptomatic infection also occurs in people and this can obviously lead to underdiagnosis. So, um, as in all underreported diseases, the data is not very good. What are the risk factors for leptospirosis in the Caribbean? So this is, it took a long time to get here. It may look very simple, but it took us all day to do this analysis. So the factors in green are the climactic factors. Climate change contributes to flooding, contributes to higher temperature, humidity, and so on. It's a seasonal disease, uh, as I said, associated with rainy season, high humidity, and rainfall. Um, the factors in, the circles in gray at the bottom are the animal factors. So infected domestic animals, including dogs, wildlife, infected wildlife such as mongoose and manicou, and rodents um, are also contributing factors. The ones on, uh, in 
light blue are the human behavioral factors. So recreational exposure, I talked about all these things that you do in water. Uh, men and teenage boys, the ratio was interesting to me, the ratio in the Caribbean of men, males to females infected with lepto is two to one. I think the girls won't go out in the dirty floodwaters barefoot. I think the men are more the boys, the teenage boys, especially much more like I have, I have a 20 year old son. He don't care, you know, <laughs> dirty water, clean water. The girls aren't going to do that as much, I think. I think that might be why the prevalence is higher. Also, the occupations are much more associated with male occupations. You know, people that work in abattoirs, um, people that work with livestock, sewer workers, that sort of thing is much, much more likely to be male. Um, and then a lot of these recreational activities, fishing and stuff, might be, might be male dominated as well. So all these things infect urine and spreads it to people, right? So then we took each one of these factors and tried to come up with a prevention strategy to prevent the transmission into people. So we did this risk factor analysis to develop these One Health recommendations to prevent lepto getting into people. And to improve surveillance clinical diagnosis because remember I said that it's missed. It, humans that present with acute undifferentiated fever are very rarely tested for lepto or treated for lepto. Um, I shouldn't say very rarely, but it, it is a problem. We have recommendations for public health to improve diagnosis in humans. There's something called modified Fane's criteria in human medicine that is a diagnostic algorithm for lepto. If it's this and this, then it's lepto. There's also similarly, WHO has guidelines for uh, undifferenti undifferentiated fevers, especially if the rapid test for dengue is negative. Um, improving case management. WHO recommends that all cases of acute undifferentiated fever get put on antibiotics. You can't hurt a person with dengue or chikungunya putting them on antibiotics. I think it's important to take a history too. Find out, do they work with animals? Have they been in water, you know, stagnant water, doing anything? What sort of occupation they have as well? But um, they're very strong on the, anti initiate antibiotic treatment as early as possible. Um, I'm very big on this integrating surveillance between humans and animals. Remember yesterday I talked about Dominica, the vet services found uh, an outbreak of lepto in pigs before the outbreak happened in people and they say they had a hard time getting the public health people to listen to them uh, about this. I think exchanging data and information is so important in all zoonosis. If you can stop it in, remember the graph, if you can stop it in the animals before it gets into the people, you're way ahead of the game. Um, and then improving outbreak investigation by finding out what is your national baseline for lepto. Uh, these are important for you. The recommendations that were made for the veterinary services are to determine which animal species are the source of the infection and to direct control measures to target the local reservoir. Much easier, obviously, if it's domestic animals than wildlife. Um, and, and that the vet services should do some research on the prevalent lepto servers in rodents, humans, animals, dogs, uh, domestic animals. Uh, so find out what's circulating so that if you have an outbreak in people, you can try to match the cerevar against the animal and figure out where it's coming from so that you can do some sort of prevention. A lot of biosecurity for farmers to prevent rodent access to the farm. Um, and we've been talking about biosecurity all day improving the work environment so that people in high-risk occupations are protected through wearing PPE and, and uh, rodent proofing, uh, food type operations, abattoirs and, and so on, and um, providing sanitary facilities in the workplace, which isn't always done in the Caribbean, promoting a lot of hand washing and boots and gloves and things like that. Uh, th these are recommendations for the legal framework and emergency planning to include outbreaks of lepto in disaster planning in response after hurricanes and floods. Um, food safety and environmental legislation should include proper waste disposal, rodent proofing and so on of food type establishments. And then uh, pest control, 
using clean water sources and waste disposal, obviously, uh, garbage attracts rodents. Recommendations for flood prevention and management to improve drainage and so on, and also public awareness in a flood to uh, people, you know, the boil water advisories, stocking up on bottled water and so on, so that people are not consuming contaminated water.